Imagine this. You're camping in the woods with friends, chilling. Suddenly, everyone perceives something coming from the woods. One of your friends says, my grandma told me La Llorona roams around these woods. Another friend interrupts and says, guys, what if it's just a lost kid? I got lost when I was little and I know how it felt. We need to help them. Then you add, I'm not sure what it is, but it sounded like big steps and it came from the direction of the lake. Finally, another friend says, yes, I didn't hear it well, but I did see a big body in the direction of the lake. This example reveals many points that we will address in this video. But the first thing we can notice is that although everyone is presented with the same information, the way we interpret that information reveals different aspects of reality. After all, what is reality anyway? How do we know what is real? What do you think? Is it La Llorona? A lost kid? Any other idea? How do you know? For now, what we can say is that whatever it is, it remains in the unknown. Welcome to these videos about scientific thinking. My name is David, and I will guide you on your adventure to explore the unknown. And in the meantime, become a skilled thinker. I hope you're ready for that adventure because here we go. There's a centuries long debate about what reality is. And although we're not gonna dive into the details of that deep philosophical discussion, we can highlight one aspect of it. Whatever we consider being real allows us to make good decisions and have a meaningful existence as individuals and as a society. Therefore, the more you know what counts as real, the better you can act. Now, there are many ways in which we can access or infer reality. In our example, we can see what counts as possibly real for each of your friends and yourself included. For the one who thinks it may be a kid, what informs their hypothesis is their personal insightful experience. This is typically known as inductive reasoning, in which to understand the external world, you relate to the understanding of yourself. Inductive thinking allows us to build up knowledge from the inside out. Once you understand your struggles, your understanding of the others increases. In this sense, induction is the foundation of empathy. However, since your understanding of the outside world depends only on your perspective, you only have one data point to extract conclusions, which turns out to be too personal and anecdotal. Your friend, who thinks it was La Llorona, bases their assumption on what they have been told, even though they haven't experienced it directly. This is what is called abductive reasoning. Here, we understand the external world according to what the general knowledge in a society and culture is. Traditions, culture, habits, and authority. Abductive thinking is highly efficient. Since there are too many things to learn in the world, listening to authorities in the traditions of our society and culture facilitates the acquisition of knowledge. On the other hand, many of those traditions may be too old and in need to an update. In this sense, it leaves new elements unattended. Abductive thinking is an old, blind, and low-resolution strategy, and it makes a lot of mistakes. In many occasions, when we use it, we add what we should not include, and we discard what we should actually count. Finally, you and your friend rely on argumentation and organized description of the phenomena so that you both can agree on what you think is real. This is the process called deductive thinking. In this type of thinking, understanding the external world depends on precise data with as little of personal and cultural influence. Deductive thinking is highly precise and accurate in its estimations, and it takes data from multiple sources. However, because of all the resources, time, and effort that it takes, it becomes tremendously costly. As you can see, all types of thinking has pros and cons. We all use these three types of thinking every single day of our lives for different reasons in different situations. Where do you think it is the best niche for science? Among the three kinds, science thrives in deduction. 
Science detaches from personal and cultural influences. It takes massive amounts of data and aims to find agreement among the scientific community. This makes doing science extremely hard. But if it wasn't hard enough already, there is an extra characteristic that makes science even more difficult. Scientist and philosopher Karl Popper concluded that in order to make sure that we are not just trying to convince the rest of the world about our perspective, the goal of a scientist is not to prove that something is real, but to postulate an idea and then try to prove it wrong. In other words, if you postulate that your idea is solid, you should not try to defend it. Instead, as a good scientist, you do the opposite. You try to take it down with all your might. You don't defend it, you attack it and invite others to do the same. So yeah, that's completely counterintuitive. This is why scientists insist on the high value of science to define reality outside of our personal and cultural beliefs. But how do you do that? Because science is relatively new for humanity, and it is so counterintuitive, the scientific community develops a sort of map that takes you step by step through a very rigorous process observation, hypothesis, methods, and results. You may know this map as the scientific method. Okay, you get it, science is hard. Now you might think, gathering lots of data, proving my ideas wrong, agreeing with other people, what's the point? Is that really for me? Very legitimate concerns. Here's an idea. If you wanted to do science in a way that is meaningful to you, you should calibrate your compass to balance three conditions. First, you should find a topic that triggers your curiosity, something that is of personal interest, something that you like and you feel passionate about, so that rather than a task, it feels like an enriching experience. Second, make sure that what you're doing has an actual impact on society in the here and now. Your action should have a direct application in a community. After all, we're not isolated entities. We live in interconnected societies. We depend on our communities. So contributing to society is a form of gratitude. Third, make sure that your contribution has consequences at larger scales and it is transcendent. Think about how your actions may change the course of history and improve humanity and the whole world. Dream big. The balance of these conditions is important. If you only act on personal interest, your actions become selfish, wasteful, and aimless. You may want to find what it is in the woods only to satisfy your ego. If you only do it for the here and now, you are at risk of becoming mechanical, uninterested, and aimless. While looking for what is in the woods, you might get bored and lose track of the goal. If you only do it for your long-term goal, you become blind. Looking for what is in the woods, you may get so focused on the goal that you forget about you and the community. Your ends could justify your means. A while ago, Kant warned us, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. Deep stuff. Today, you learn about the three types of thinking that allows us to solve problems and understand reality. You are aware of the pros and cons. You also know that science as a form of deductive thinking is a very demanding endeavor. So to make it for a meaningful experience, you should find a balance between passion, impact, and transcendence. Next time, we're gonna talk about the map for your scientific adventure and how to begin your journey following the steps of great thinkers. For the moment, Kudos on becoming a thinker and for calibrating your compass. Hopefully you can apply this knowledge in other areas of your life too. And I'll see you next time at the door of scientific practice. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.